Hey, what's up everybody? Uh, I live in the Pacific Northwest and the fires from California all the way up to where we are, actually even just down the road, um, have made the air quality awful. So getting outside for any kind of running or any kind of lecturing where I'm going up and down all the time right now on the chalkboard, uh, it's just, it's not healthy. So I've decided to kind of stay home. Um, I filmed this whole thing with with an N95 mask that the county actually gave us. So thank you, county. Um, anyway, uh, so for the time being, until things rectify or until I can get in my car and drive to the other side of the country, uh, everything's gonna be kind of low key and not super adventurous. So sorry, but at the same time, um, we're okay here and I hope you're okay where you're at. Hello and welcome back to our series on vertex operator algebras. Today, we put the D in calculus by examining the derivation of formal series. You know, that formalism that will help us model things that behave kind of like quantum fields. First, a quick review of the relevant facts. You might recall from recent discussions that a formal series is a map from a field to a vector space, which is represented as a sum indexed by F including a formal variable z. The space of formal series over v is denoted with braces and have many useful subspaces. Of course, we have the finite polynomials and Laurent polynomials, but also their infinite cousins, which you might refer to as a series, and are also indexed in a countable way. We can also restrict to the scalars provided by the series and polynomials over f. As we consider these beasts or some of the associated subspaces, we will often deal with various operations on these formal series. And because of this, we worry about things like existence, that is the closure of these operations in the space of formal series. We will often deal with formal series over the vector space of endomorphisms of V, and as such, we will call them operators. Closure or existence from the perspective of endomorphisms or operators can be a little funny to define. Bad infinities appear when the coefficients of individual terms in the formal series, the components of some infinite dimensional vector, if you like, become infinite themselves. The notion of summability is meant to deal with this, and if a coefficient of a series, phi sub i, in this case, itself is an infinite sum of terms, sub-indexed, in this case by n, is said to be summable if the action of all phi sub i n on v vanish except for maybe finitely many n. In other words, the coefficient operator phi sub i on v is equivalent to a finite sum. In other words, it's finite. That's a sticky set of definitions, and if things aren't immediately clear to you, you might go back to lecture 27 to review them. The delta function is a formal series over the integers with each coefficient set to unity. And it has the property that together with any finite Laurent polynomial, the argument of that polynomial amounts to whatever sends the argument of the delta function to unity. Now, this isn't magic, and there aren't any integrals involved like you might remember from the Dirac delta function. Rather, this is just due to the nature of infinite sums over the integers, as we saw in lecture 28. Okay, on to the topic du jour, derivations. You might remember that if A is some algebra with elements little a, little b, a derivation D acting on the product AB is DA times B plus A times DB. It's a map, sure, but not an isomorphism. A derivation of formal sums has a similar behavior, but perhaps one that's a little bit more familiar from calculus. We also define the operator big D, which acts like you might expect, and is basically the degree derivation that we've been playing with of late. Of course, we can also define a more general derivation based on the polynomial, say, P of Z, or in the particular operators T sub M, which form a familiar Lie algebra, namely the Witt algebra, i.e. the endomorphisms of Laurent polynomials over F. Big D will play an important role in what follows, and so we might also consider the subspace of formal series D, V, Z, which are defined by removing the constant terms from the formal series over V. 
In this space, big D is invertible with an inverse that resembles the antiderivative. But perhaps what is most interesting about big D, not unrelated to the clear connection to the commutator subalgebras investigated earlier, is that by removing the class and terms, you often remove the issue of operator ordering. You know, those things we discovered when we discussed the Virasoto generator L sub zero. Now, FLM goes through a series of identities involving derivations of delta functions, uh, which perhaps some of you might notice smells a lot like calculations that we do in physics, particularly in quantum field theory. More on that much later on in the series, of course. We will simply state these identities here for you and prove one of them, hopefully to convince you that it's a rather easy, if boring, exercise that you might do just to get that all-important tactile experience with these beasts. First, you might recall one of the basic results about delta functions. For one or more formal variables, we proved last time by simply shifting the summation's index around. Morally, the idea was that the argument of the delta function must always be unity when applied to other operators. So first, some formal series V times the delta function of A Z, where A is some non-zero scalar. This time we find two terms, one proportional to the derivation of V, which we denote with, you know, the traditional prime, evaluated at one over A, and one proportional to simply V, again, evaluated at one over A. We then consider the two variable case, two variables is complicated because we can consider either the z1 derivative or the z2 derivative. Here we are sure to note that we're evaluating the variable opposite the one that we're taking the d derivative with. You might worry whether or not you were forced into that choice. And this is where you're really going to want to crack those series open for yourself to figure out these kinds of details. Note that eventually we're going to be really interested in taking the limits where all of these variables become identified. In physics, these limits are to some extent familiar from analysis, although that makes them weird in a conformally invariant quantum field theory, where scale invariance is the primary symmetry of the theory that we consider. Epsilons and deltas don't have much meaning when there's a continuous symmetry relating small, medium, and large scales. The third and fourth identities involve the general operator T of P of Z, and its results kind of follow pretty much from the proofs of the other two that we saw. A particular result worth highlighting here is the identity associated to the big D operator. It's not surprising or anything, but we will see it again and again in what follows. Again, proving these relationships is rather easy, and I hope to convince you of that by proving the first one. The rest you can do as an exercise. So we claim that the first identity is true. And so here's the proof. First recall the basic delta function identity, which we proved in lecture 28, and whose main technique was simply shifting the dummy index of the infinite sums around. We then take a derivation of the left-hand side and evaluate what we can. We then take the derivation of the right-hand side. So setting the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side, we find the relation, which of course implies our desired identity. And so we're done. And we're also done for today. Next time, we'll reformat our discussion of affine Lie algebras in terms of formal series. Don't miss it.